Thank you, Boris. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to be a little bit of, I think, a different presentation. It's not going to be a lot of beautiful work, I should warn you. It's actually going to be quite a lot of ugly work because I'm going to take you through the very early years of my career, which were a series of rejections over and over and over and over and over again um, until the moment that leaves me here, that lands me here today with you. Um, I've been doing my podcast, Design Matters, for uh, going on 11 years now. And the show has changed from being a podcast about design to a podcast about how creative people design their lives. I've become really obsessed with the trajectory that people's lives take. What are the decisions that we make to become who we are? What are the obstacles that we have to overcome? And as a result, I've come to um, realize that I'm obsessed with this question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I find now that I ask nearly everyone of almost any age what they want to be when they grow up. And I hear all sorts of different answers, um, everything from a fireman to a policeman to a teacher to famous, any number of things. And I recently asked the question to a young girl in her teens, and she responded with the best answer that I've ever heard. When I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up, she looked at me without blinking an eye and said, everything. And that mesmerized me. It mesmerized me and it also broke my heart a little bit because I realized when I was her age, I actually had no idea what I wanted to be. In fact, I'd already begun the process of self-selecting all the things I couldn't be. I have always loved magazines. I first fell in love with magazines when one of our neighbors, when I was very, very young, had a subscription to Vogue. And I'd go through the pages and I'd see all the beautiful women and all the beautiful clothes and wished that I could live that lifestyle. When I was in the fifth grade, I had a best friend whose name was also Debbie. And we decided the summer between fifth and sixth grade that we were going to create our very own magazine. And because both of our names was, were Debbie, we decided very cleverly we were going to title the magazine Debutante. <laughs> Clever. We drew and wrote the entire thing. We spent the entire summer drawing and writing this magazine. My biggest regret to this day is that I don't have the only copy we made. I know Sabine, I think, showed her, her copy that she had. I don't have mine to show you. What I will show you, though, is a drawing that I made when I was about eight years old that I think, without my even knowing it, ended up predicting most of my life. This is my drawing. So, I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up, I was born in Brooklyn, then we moved to Queens, then we moved to Staten Island, then my parents got divorced, my mom hightailed it with us to Long Island, and my dad moved to Manhattan. It was really only until my teenage years that I really got to know Manhattan. When I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I had this fantasy about what New York would be like. All the women would be wearing clothes from Vogue, of course. Um, so, so here I am here with this woman in orange. She's not wearing something from Vogue. She's actually wearing a very popular Barbie outfit at the time, Tangerine Dream. And you can see the, av the usual sights in New York City, the bus that's very, very aptly titled bus, the taxi that's titled da taxi, cleaners, cleaner, bank, bank. Look at the green truck. The green truck not only says potato chips, the green truck says Lay's potato chips, and I drew the logo. At eight years old, I drew the logo. A cautionary tale. Be careful what you wish for, because what I've ended up doing for most of the rest of my life was drawing logos. 
even though I still had this incredible passion for working in magazines. I went to school in Albany. I went to the State University of New York at Albany, which is a state school, which means it was a a lot more affordable than the private schools in the United States. I went for two reasons. One, because it was a state school and I could afford it, barely. And the second, because my best friend Tammy was going there. I stopped being best friends with Debbie and now became best friends with Tammy. Tammy went to SUNY Albany. I decided to go to SUNY Albany as well. Not a lot of guidance from the parents who were busy getting divorced yet again. When I went to school, I thought perhaps I would do something with magazines. Maybe I'd be a writer. Maybe I'd be somebody that worked in the art department. I didn't really know that there was such a thing as design at the time. I majored in English literature with a minor in Russian literature in English translation. I now joke that I have a degree in reading. But what I found when I got to SUNY Albany was that the school had two really wondrous things. One was a student magazine called Tangent, which I started writing for immediately. I told you there was going to be a lot of really ugly design. And then I started working for the student newspaper, which was called the Albany Student Press. By the time I got to my senior year, I had become the editor of the Arts and Features section, which I fancied the school newspaper version of the New York Times Magazine section. I'm very sorry, Gail. <laughs> so my final issue of the Albany Student Press and my section, which was called Aspects, get it, Asp, Aspects, was a piece that I had created as an homage to James Joyce, who I'd been studying that senior year of college. I had been reading Ulysses, and when I came across the line, the longest way round is the shortest way home, my heart stopped a bit. I, don't know, I didn't know why at the time, but that line resonated so deeply within me that I decided I needed to make it the headline of the section of the school newspaper, my final edition, which was an ode to James Joyce. Please notice the really beautiful combination of Peño and Souvenir, the only two typefaces we had at the Albany Student Press. <laughs> I graduated in the summer of 1983, the summer that I affectionately call the summer of modern love by David Bowie and synchronicity by the police. Here I am in 1983. The hair is a bit improved, I think, although with the mic, it's a little hard to say. Again, the use of Peño and Souvenir on my homemade resume. What I had found when I was working on the Albany Student Press was that I really wasn't as interested in the editorial as I was in the design. And even though I was the editor of the magazine section, I really, really loved doing the design. So what I would do is I'd hire writers to write the longest possible articles they could. They were very verbose, very prolific just so I could have more pages to design. And so when I started to look for a job, I knew I had some skills in editing and some skills in design, although one might question the um, ability of either. Um, but if you look at my resume, what you can see here is, are my skills. So it says technical skills include the operation of the CompuGraphic computer photographic typesetting equipment, the MDT350 terminal, the Trendsetter 88 typesetter, the 7200 ITG headliner, the AgfaGvert vertical camera. I had mad skills in the stat room. <laughs> mad skills. So this is what, this was the only marketable thing I could do. So I graduated college in 1983, with a portfolio of clips from the Albany Student Press with one dream, to work at Condé Nast, to work at Vanity Fair magazine. That was my only dream. Vanity Fair had recently been relaunched. He, the magazine was relaunched more as a literary magazine, so sort of a magazine version of what I thought of as the, the aspects that I was doing. And I went, and what was customary at the time, Condé Nast, was you dropped off your portfolio. And my portfolio was the faux 
leather, brown, zippered pocket portfolio with the plastic sleeves that I had tucked my articles in. And when you turn the pages, they made that plasticky, plasticky, flappy sound. I dropped it off with the high hopes of getting a callback, which was also customary at the time. That's how you'd get your way into the HR department. And lo and behold, I got a callback. It was somewhat miraculous if you look at the kind of work I was doing. They wanted to meet me in HR. When I got to HR, I was wearing a bow blouse with pin dots on it, an outfit my mother had made for me, an A-line skirt and a bolero jacket. I was wearing little patent leather flats. I had fallen on my way to the interview, so I had a giant hole on, in my hose, but it was under the skirt, so I felt that if I covered it, nobody would notice the blood dripping down my knee. True story. The HR person was sort of the kind of woman you'd see in The Devil Wears Prada. She was beautiful, she had thin arms, she was wearing a, a sleeveless shift, and she sat and looked at me, the chubby girl from Long Island with the bitten nails and the bad hair, and asked me what kind of work I wanted to do in magazines. I didn't say everything. I said, anything. <laughs> and I didn't get the job. I ended up getting a job working at a magazine called Rockbill, which was a magazine that was launched the summer before by a couple of my college alum. And it was a magazine that was given out at rock and roll venues, sort of like Playbill is given out at theater venues. And I was, again, sort of doing both. I was doing a little bit of editorial, a little bit of design. I was making $6 an hour. It was really, really difficult to get by in New York City, even in 1983, on $6 an hour. I was living in a fourth floor tenement walk up. I had to walk through somebody else's bedroom to get to mine, which made for some difficulties and awkwardness at times. Um, and it was really difficult. Um, I felt at the time that if I was going to be an editor, that maybe I should go back to school and get a graduate degree. And so I decided to apply to the best journalism school in New York City, the Columbia School of Journalism. My father had gone to Columbia, He's, he was a pharmacist, so I thought, well, they look, they look very kindly on legacy types of situations. Um, and I had to go and I had to do a test on the spot where you had to write an article about politics. I was really hoping to write an article about fashion. And six weeks later, after I had taken that test, I got an envelope in the mail. For anybody that's ever gotten an envelope in the mail from a university, you know, the big fat ones are the ones stuffed with financial aid information. The thin ones are the rejection letters. And I got rejected. I was very sad. At that point, I thought, well, OK, the editorial is sort of by the wayside. Let's try the art. And so you think I'm joking. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> I had been drawing and painting, as you can see, from a very young age. This is a representative painting I did at the time. I think that this really shows my mindset of what I wished I could have. Everything. Um, I had submitted my slides, because they were slides that we used back then, to an, a, a competition I'd seen like in the back of art annual whatever magazine. And lo and behold, I won this little contest, which was a, to have an exhibit at uh, Long Island University, the Brooklyn campus, which was sort of the drug campus uh, back in Brooklyn at that time in the early 90s. Um, and this is what it looked like. I did 100 small word paintings. And from a linear perspective, it looked like this. And it got some good reviews. So it really buoyed my hopes that maybe I could make it as a designer. And I decided that, once again, I didn't have enough education. I didn't feel confident in anything that I was doing. I thought, well, maybe I'll go back to school. And I applied to the one program that I thought was the best program in New York, which was the Whitney Independent Study Program. And I had all my clips from my college days and all my slides from the Long Island University show. And lo and behold, I also got the thin envelope. <laughs> At this point, I'm like, okay, I just will be happy working at Rockville. <laughs> 
Now, something really interesting happened when I was working at Rockville, and you'll probably, for those, I'm sure this is a very big audience of, of magazine writers and designers. My editor hated the publisher. Hated the publisher. He decided he was going to quit out of political differences with the publisher. Before he quit, he asked me if I wanted his job. I was the managing editor. He was offering me the job of editor-in-chief. But he was also my really, really good friend. He's still a really good friend of mine to this day. And I thought, if I take his job, what is that going to say about his political stance against the publisher? It will dilute it. I can't take the job. That would be a bad friend. So I turned down the job. He offered it to the other editor beneath me, who said yes. And all of a sudden, the editor that was beneath me was now my boss. I was like, I got to get out of here now. <laughs> I get, and, and for my whole career, I've wondered, what would have happened if I take, like, maybe I could have been the editor of Rolling Stone at some point. In any case, I, I left and I started a very small company, a design firm, with the then creative director, who was also very sad and depressed that we had lost our editor for political reasons um, after hating the publisher so much. At this point, I should remind you, or I should tell you, confess to you, that I was making $21,000 a year as a managing editor of the magazine. It was really tough. So Cliff and I, Cliff Sloan and I, decided to start this company called Sloan Millman. Again, I prepared you, I told you, I was going to show you a lot of ugly work. This was the early 90s, so please forgive the vertical and horizontal scaling of every typeface on this cover. <laughs> we did horrible work. We did horrible work. We just did work that we could get to pay our bills. And at that time, I saw this. This was the moment in New York design where everybody in the world was paying attention to New York design. And I was doing things like Mickey's World Tour. <laughs> this was Tibor Kelman's moment. This was Stephen Doyle's moment. This was Emily Oberman's moment. This was Bill Drentel's moment and Manhattan design and double space. And I was doing Mickey's World Tour. <laughs> this magazine came out. This was not a magazine, this was actually an annual report. And this was the first time an annual report had a real reason for being. It was actually like a magazine. It was telling the story of why Time and Warner had merged. And the question on the cover of the annual report was why. And the company that did this was a company called Frankfurt Gibbs Balkind. And I saw this and I thought, I have to learn how to do this kind of work. I have to get a job at Frankfurt Gibbs Balkind. And a friend of mine knew the brother of Steve Frankfurt. So my friend's lawyer was the brother of Steve Frankfurt. And when I told my friend this story, this dream I had of working at Frankfurt Gibbs Balkind, she put me in touch with Steve Frankfurt. I met Steve Frankfurt. I showed him my work. And... <laughs> He actually kind of liked me. Not, not in any kind of other way than platonic. He actually thought I was adorable. In, the, in my early 30s, I'm in my mid-50s now, I was adorable. <laughs> but in order to get the job, I had to meet with Aubrey Balkind, the big partner. I met with Aubrey. For the first five minutes of meeting with him, he looked through my portfolio and did not say a word. At the end of looking at my portfolio, he shut the portfolio. He said, Steve really likes you. He wants me to hire you, but I will not hire you as a designer. I wanted to work there so badly. I, you know, it was one, another one of those moments. I could have just looked at him and said, I'll do anything. I'll sweep. You know, just give me a broom and I'll be the janitor if I get to learn. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, I became an account executive and I started to work there. And I learned. I learned. I learned a lot. One of the biggest things I learned was do not ever go work for somebody that doesn't like you. And Aubrey never liked me. I don't know if it's because Steve liked me so much or because my work was so bad, but he didn't like me. So I worked there for about a year. And after a year of just being just tortured by, by Aubrey, um, I left. 
I left because I got headhunted to another company that I took this job without even thinking about, only because I needed to be able to pay my rent. And it was a company called Sterling Brands. Actually, at the time, it was called the Sterling Group. I went from being a, a bad designer to being an account executive at Frankfurt Balkind to what seemed like the lowliest possible position at Sterling Brands, which was a salesperson. I really felt like I had lost all of my dignity. But what I found once I got to Sterling was that they were doing this thing called branding. And what I was selling were their skills as brand consultants. And if you think back to my little drawing at eight years old, the Lay's potato chips truck, my father was a pharmacy, I grew up around products and brands, all of a sudden I found that I was good at talking about brands, talking about why people buy the things that they do, and suddenly I had a career at a brand consultancy. And I did that, and I've been doing that for the last 20 years. However, when I got to Sterling, even though it was a good paying job, I still really longed for community with designers. I still wanted to be surrounded by designers. I still wanted to be learning about design. And so I looked and did a lot of research, and I found the AIGA had this organization, American Institute of Graphic Arts, had a, a center for brand experience. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. I have the design thing there, and I have the branding thing, and I could just get involved and volunteer and learn and be part of a community that feels bigger than something I could ever do on my own. And so I volunteered, and I got on the board of this little subgroup within AIGA, and they weren't funded by any of the local state chapters or city chapters. They were self-funded, and so we had to do things like have flea markets and bake cupcakes. I baked a lot of cupcakes in order to raise money, and I did it for three years, and I loved every second of it. When my term was up, everybody that was on the board was going to be rolling off the board at the same time. So they decided, this group decided, the, I guess the head of the group, decided that the people that were on the board could reapply and some people would be asked to stay on. And so I reapplied with much zeal and enthusiasm. And I found out when I was told um, that I was not going to be on the board and what I found out was that every single person that had been on the board was asked to be on the board again, except for me. I was the only one that was rejected. And I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, my cupcakes were good. The design was still not great, but I wasn't doing any design. The cupcakes were actually really good. Um, and I ended up meeting with Rick Raffae, who was the executive director at the time, who asked me if I wanted to have lunch with him. And I said, sure. I had lunch with him, and he apologized for my being kicked to the curb, so to speak, um, and asked me to try to hang in there. He thought that the AIGA could really use people like me. Um, and as a consolation prize of sorts, he asked me if I would be interested in judging the upcoming graphic design competition. And he asked me if I would judge the package design section. And I thought, oh my God, this is the biggest honor of my life. Hell yeah, I'm going to do this. And as part of the credentials that were going to be included in the annual, he asked if I would submit some of the work that I had done with Sterling. So I submitted work that I had actually done some design work on, the Burger King identity, which we had done in 1999. And um, that was too fast. <laughs> and work that we had done for Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. So I went to the judging that day. There were two other judges, one from a very small New York design firm who has very, very prestigious clients, and the other was a guy from Apple who was really just there for the free trip. The woman designer that was there hated me on site. She told me immediately that there was no way that any mass-marketed sodas, soft drinks, or salty snacks were ever going to make the annual. And we fought all day about what was good brand design. We had 700 entries to look at. We were supposed to probably pick about 50 to 100 to go into the annual, and we could only agree on seven. <laughs> at that moment, I knew that my career with AIGA was over. So that was that. I figured 
I got rejected from the brand experience group. Clearly, the people that are doing the annual are never, ever going to call me to do anything ever again. And I figured I needed to just walk away, lick my wounds, and move on. In the meantime, I just continued doing my work. And on May 2nd, 2003, my life changed. Everything, there's a div div dividing line in my life before May 2nd, 2003, and after May 2nd, 2003. I want to paint the picture of the world for you in 2003. There was very little Google. The only things we were really doing online were buying things from the J. Crew catalog, playing games, emailing, and porn. That was pretty much it. The magazines were still sort of the king of the world in terms of information and entertainment. All of a sudden, this thing started to happen. There were these blogs. And May 2nd, 2003, a friend of mine sent me a link to a design blog. I had never heard of a blog before, definitely hadn't heard of a design blog, and went to a blog called Speak Up. It was started by a 22-year-old guy in Chicago named Armin Witt. And I was very, very surprised by what I saw. The article is titled, AIGA Sold Out. And it goes on to criticize AIGA for choosing the judges for their annual competition. And the only person they call out is me. Another reason to cry is that Debbie Millman has been in the business 20 years, and I'm, they're referring to a letters to the editor. I had emailed the editor of Graphic Design USA, which I didn't even know he had published, has always been the magazine she turns to for cultural relevance and design intelligence. Perhaps she is lying simply to see her name in print, or maybe she's actually telling the truth. Either way, we're doomed. Year by year, the AIGA gets suckered into deals with these corporate clowns. That hurt. What I didn't realize until a few moments later, that there was a little number at the end of the article with a link that you could click in, and that was comments. And this is what I saw. Not that I'm a particularly faithful or enthusiastic consumer, but as a designer, I have to point out a lousy makeover when I see one. The flying oval Burger King logo just looks desperate and sad. Same with the Midas and Pringles logos. I didn't do those. They all spin indiscriminately from the witless school of logo design. You see an establishment of growing corporate poison. This poison, represented here by she-devil, Debbie Millman, is conspiring with AIGA to permeate the integrity of our precious design world, killing any possibility of a talented, anti-establishment, lone wolf like yourself from ever succeeding and getting recognized. This next one really hurt. Oh, not this one, the next one after that, but this one hurt too. This is from Armin. This is from Armin Witt, the proprietor, the founder of Speak Up. Boy, talk about a pair of turds that got sidetracked. Turds kinds of means shit. Those two packages, although they serve the need of whatever bullshit explanation anyone wants to throw, should not be included in what is supposed to be the graphic design publication of America. John Bielenberg said this one. He was one of my heroes, unbeknownst to him. I happen to be judging the AIGA competition the same day as Debbie Millman. I may be mistaken, but I think she was filling in for someone who couldn't make it that day. And it's funny now, 13 years later, but at the time, it was the worst day of my life. This last comment, but trust me, there's no hidden agenda to change the integrity of the organization or look the other way when someone like Millman takes advantage of their involvement. In that case, is AIGA really to blame? I felt like the entire design world hated me. The anti-establishment here at Speak Up hated me, and the establishment at AIGA hated me. 
and I didn't know what to do. I was so humiliated. I felt so embarrassed. I felt like if my company that I worked at found out about this, they would be horrified and ashamed, and it was because of me. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I walked home thinking, I remember walking home from work that night thinking, I, should, I have to leave the business. I have to figure out something else to do. This was only 13 years ago. I was in my 40s at this point. It was not going to be that easy to start a new career. And so I stopped. I just had to stop looking at it. I had to stop reading it. But after a week or two, it was really bothering me, and the comments were piling up, and I thought, I have to, I have to say something. I have to say something. I have to, I have to defend myself. And I did something at the time that I felt was my only choice. Um, I look back on it now with, again, some hum humi humiliation and shame. I, I was disingenuous with my contribution. I wrote, what a cool discussion. I love it. <laughs> I know. I was trying to be the cool girl trying to show that nothing would bother me, even though I was dying inside. And I ended up having a conversation, a dialogue online with Armin and Felix Sockwell and Tan Lee, and they all sort of piled in and made fun of me some more. And then a guy named Dave Weinberger came in and uh, defended me. He worked at Landor. Of course, he defended me. Um, and and that was sort of that. He, he ended it by saying, great work over there at Sterling. And little did I know, at the time, it was 2003, there's always an arc of a trajectory to blog posts. Everybody piles in on someone. They make fun of them to no end. That person comes in. Everybody gets a little embarrassed that they have bullied this person. They pull back, and then it's over. I didn't know that at the time. I don't think anybody in the world knew that that's the way most blog posts would unfurl at that time. And I thought it was over. I'm like, okay, well, Dave had the last word, and let's move on. But it wasn't. They kept writing about me. In this lovely article called, Is the Dark Side Prevailing? As if I'm Valdemort. <laughs> the recent discussions about Debbie Millman has yielded some very thought-provoking issues. It's also bummed me out. And at that point, I asked my IT guy at Sterling to forbid me permission to see this website anymore. I needed it to not be even something I could go to, even if I wanted to. And that was really that. But no. <laughs> this is where the line, this is where things start to get better. Strange things started to happen. The first thing was that Armin Witt wrote me an email. But two weeks after, is the dark side prevailing? And he wrote me an email apologizing. He wrote me an email apologizing not for calling my work a pair of turds. He made that very clear. <laughs> but because he felt that what was done was unprofessional. And I was very happy to receive the email. But I also felt that there was something really interesting going on in this world of blogging, this real-time information, this real-time dialogue, holding people accountable, as long as it wasn't me, for the work that they were doing. And I told him all of that. And in response, he then asked me if I wanted to write for Speak Up. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do anything. <laughs> and, and there, it, and there was my first post, <laughs> aptly titled, Design Regrets. And all of a sudden, I felt this community that I had been searching for, people that were trying to talk about design, advocate for design, shake things up a little bit. And as, as a group, we decided we were going to go to the upcoming AIGA conference in Vancouver, and we were going to give out these brochures that we had created, which were the best comments of the previous year on Speak Up, which we titled Stop Being Sheep instead of Stop Stealing Sheep. And we went to the AIGA conference in Vancouver that November of 2003, and guerrilla style distributed all of these brochures on the conference chairs and in bathrooms and in 
breakout group rooms and so forth. En route to the conference, the Vancouver flight, there were two Vancouver flights every day going to, from New York nonstop to Vancouver. And so you can imagine the flights were filled with New York designers going to the conference. I was sitting in a middle seat. I get to my seat, the woman sitting at the window looks like the woman from Condé Nast, beautiful, chic, I'm in like my pajamas and holding a McDonald's food bag. Um, and I sit next to her and we start talking about the conference and she says she's going to the conference too and I tell her what I'm doing and she said that she's a writer for print magazine. And I get very impressed because I'm always impressed by people that work at magazines. And I tell her what I'm doing, that we're going to have this sort of guerrilla style speak up thing and we're having a party and I invited her to come and she gave me her business card to follow up with information. Without looking at it, I put it in my bag. I get to my hotel room, I pull out the card to write to her, and I find out oh, she's the editor in chief. Oh my God, it's amazing. So Joyce came, she did come to the party, and about four or five months later, she wrote me and asked me if I would be part of something she was putting together the following year for the How Design Live conference. How, design, how Magazine and Print Magazine were owned by the same publisher. She was putting on a little curated selection of panels and wanted me to be part of something she was calling Ironic Chef. And Ironic Chef was a riff on the TV show Iron Chef, where chefs are on stage cooking in real time and the audience has to pick a winner. She wanted to do the same thing with design. This sounded to me like my worst nightmare. I'm not a good designer to begin with. I am now going to be on stage designing in front of other people. But I felt that if I said no to her, that she would never ask me to do anything again. And so I said, okay. When I got to San Diego where the conference was, I then found out we had to wear chef's outfits. <laughs> it's there, documented. Steve Heller was the moderator, and Steve Heller was also a writer for Print Magazine. He wrote for every issue of Print Magazine. Steve was very nice to me. There are people in the audience, I found out yesterday, that think that Steve and I are married. <laughs> Steve and I are not married. Steve is married to Louise Feely. He's been married to her for about 20 or 30 years. They have a son who's like nearly 30. So no, we've never been married. We've never even kissed. <laughs> Steve was the moderator that day and was really nice to me. And I came in second out of three. So I didn't lose, but I didn't win. But what happened after that was Joyce did write to me and did ask me to start writing for the magazine. So since 2004, I have written a column for every issue of Print Magazine. A little one, it was about 150 words about products and branding, but I had finally, finally gotten my dream of writing for what I consider to be a really good magazine. So Steve, Steve, is nice to me that day. In a moment of aberrant courage, I ask him if he wants to have lunch. He says, yes. I follow up, we have lunch. I'm so nervous about having lunch with him that I made a cheat sheet on a paper napkin that I put in my lap so that if I froze and didn't know what to say, I could refer to it. <laughs> the Yankees. Louise, his wife, the How Conference, and I guess some interview he had done with Sagmeister at that time. I told Steve about two book ideas that I had. He told me he thought they were terrible. But he said to keep thinking about new ideas that eventually he thought I could get a book under my belt. About four months later, I get a call from a publisher. Steve had been offered a book idea that he turned down. He recommended that they call me. The book was called How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer. <laughs> That's like right up there with Mickey's World Tour as far as I'm concerned. But I'm afraid that if I say no, that I'll never be given another book deal again or offered another book deal again. And so rather than say no, I say yes, but. How about if rather than creating a menu of how people should think, like a great graphic designer, I interview great graphic designers and show how they think. 
And miraculously, they said yes. Steve wrote the foreword, and my first book came out in 2007. A piece that I did on Speak Up went viral around the election of 2004. I was cold called by a fledgling radio network in Arizona about starting a radio show about design. And I thought for a moment that I was going to get rich. Like, oh my God, a radio show about design on the internet. I very quickly found out that I needed to pay them to do the show. I was just going to be, they were going to be producing it and I had to pay for the airtime. But I thought, you know what? Why not? Why not do it? Why not try to invest in something that has no commercial value? The only thing I had been doing at that point was creating logos for fast food companies. And so I started Design Matters in 2005, February of 2005, 11 years ago. In 2011, it won the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, and in December, 11 years after starting the show, it was named by iTunes as one of the best podcasts on iTunes, so that was pretty exciting. In 2007, Steve wrote me again and asked me if I'd be interested in starting a master's program at SVA on branding, and I said yes, and we started it. And then Emily Oberman, one of my heroes, wrote me. She was then the president of the New York chapter of AIGA. She asked me if I wanted to be on the board of the New York chapter. And I wasn't sure if I should remind her about what had happened, because I thought if I didn't and she found out, she would think I was being deceptive. So even after I told her, she kept her word and had me come on board for the New York chapter. It was surreal. But even more surreal was when I was asked to take over as president of all of AIGA. And at that point, here's me and all the guy presidents before me. At that point, I made a promise to AIGA that I was going to create an atmosphere of inclusivity so that people like me wouldn't feel excluded just because they weren't the best designers in the world. If they had a heart and a passion for design, they should be able to be included. And I promised that I would go to every single AIGA chapter, all 60 chapters at the time in the United States, telling this message. And I did. And I went to all the chapters, and I met the most extraordinary people. Jim Nesson was the head of the Arizona chapter and asked me to come to headline the 2009 Phoenix Design Week, which I did. When I went there, I met a guy named Tanner Woodford who was starting a pop-up museum in Chicago and asked me if I'd be interested in showing any of my personal work that hadn't been shown in 20 years in the Chicago Design Museum. And so that's what I did about three years ago. So, I started out drawing Lay's potato chips logos, and I'm still creating art about potato chips. <laughs> but what I do want to say is that if that hadn't happened, and that, 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 then nothing Nothing that happened afterward, not one of those things, not one of these things would have happened. Not one. And I would not be here today talking to you if the worst moment in my life ended up turning into the best and most important thing that ever happened to me. So. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it gives you hope, because all of that didn't happen to me until I was in my mid-40s. And so, I just, I'm not done, I'm sorry. I know, I know. <laughs> There's like a whole thing about magazines now. No, I'll be fast, I'll be fast. This is super fast. So, <laughs> they're gonna get one of those canes, another rejection. <laughs> okay, so I've been writing for print all these years. I got a call from the publisher last year asking me if I would be interested in being the editorial and creative director of the magazine. And I was like, I'll do anything. <laughs> so there's me with the first issue. So 32 years later, after my interview at Vanity Fair, when this was the cover, this is a more recent cover. They have something that they now do called the Hollywood issue. They've been doing it for 21 years now. I decided that my most recent issue was going to be a riff on the Vanity Fair issue. And I was going to create the Hollywood issue 
New York, print magazine's celebration of great New York designers. So nobody has seen this yet but you. I got this today. This is the cover. I think we're going to retouch Chip's hair a little bit so it's not quite as gray. But the Hollywood issue, New York. And here are never before seen. This is the first time I'm showing them. They're all low res, so they're really not that sharp. But I'm going to show you the, the editorial, the um, photo essay of Ho Hollywood, New York, and the designers that we shot. 55 designers in three days. Joshua Davis, James Victoria, and Tina Roth Eisenberg. Julie Annixter, the new leader of AIGA. Tobias von Schneider, the guys from The Great Discontent. Design Sponge, Eddie Opara from Pentagram, Nancy and Michael from Donovan and Green, Jessica Walsh, Liz Danzico, Mauro Porcini, Michael Beirut, Seymour Quast, Paola Antonelli, Chi Perlman, again, Timothy Goodman, Mark Kingsley, Myra Kalman, T Tobias Frere Jones, Stephen Louise, Stephen Louise, Emily Oberman, Joyce Rudder Kay, Gail Anderson, Gail Towie. Jessica Helfand, more Josh, Chip, a lot of the wonderful book designers, Karim Rashid, Hagi Sagi Haviv, Alex Isley, Bonnie Siegler, Jonathan Heffler, one of the sponsors of the conference, Matteo Bologna, Stephen Doyle, Cheryl Heller, a lot of the new kids, and of course, the Sagmeister. So, now I'm finished. The longest way around is the shortest way home. That's why I think it still will forever mean something to me. Even if it takes a long time, the longer it takes, the better it feels. And anything worthwhile takes a long time. So I'm going to leave you with some inspirationals from uh, tech entrepreneur Chris Dixon. If you aren't getting rejected on a daily basis, then your goals aren't ambitious enough. And my favorite quote, Dita Von Teese, you could be the ripest, juiciest peach in the whole world, and there's still going to be somebody who hates peaches. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This is very funny because it was not our plan, uh, but you mentioned uh, Jonathan Hoefler. I know, I thought that was so he cool. Was the f uh, the presenter of your uh, talk. He had no idea. This he had is, no idea. Yeah. No, wow, I, didn't even, I didn't even decide until yesterday that I felt <laughs> like I could okay. have the courage to face yes. you all and show it to you. Okay. I loved your way to say, um, the way of thinking in life, writing the longest article to have to design <laughs> most of the pages. <laughs> That's very simple <laughs> yeah? and very practical. And I have only one question, and then we have to stop because yeah, yeah. the people could probably want to go home um, because it was a long day. But you're a writer and a designer, both, all the time. Is there a different way to work on the one way to write or to design? Is well, it different? It's, or it's, it's really interesting. I actually don't consider myself a designer. Or if I do consider myself a designer, I consider myself a bad designer. I actually, if I'm, if I'm doing anything creative, it's some type, type of visual essay. And I see that more as an illustration or as art. But it's a brilliant design. But, well, <laughs> I, it's arguable. But I, I do think that the, the intersection of both writing and, and art or illustration is the sweet spot for me, and that's what I love doing. And for me, one has to be as good as the other. So if the, if the writing or the poetry or the essay isn't as good as the art or the illustration, then it will be a mess. So you have to really work on, on both concurrently. You can't really do one at a time. It has to be a combination of both. And so working on both of those skills for me has been a real joy. Thank you Thank so you. much, Debbie. Thank you.